Your marginally improved microphone comes with a gorgeous display, however. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I'm watching the whole... mic. This episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Every week on Hired, they run an auction where over a thousand tech companies in San Francisco, New York, and LA bid on Ruby developers, providing them with salary and equity up front. The average Ruby developer gets an average of 5 to 15 introductory offers and an average salary offer of $130,000 a year. Users can either accept an offer and go right into interviewing with the company or deny them without any continuing obligations. It's totally free for users, and when you're hired, they give you a $2,000 signing bonus as a thank you for using them. But if you use the Ruby Rogues link, you'll get a $4,000 bonus instead. Finally, if you're not looking for a job but know someone who is, you can refer them to Hired and get a $1,337 bonus if they accept the job. Go sign up at Hired.com slash Ruby Rogues. This episode is sponsored by CodeChip.com. Don't you wish you could simply deploy your code every time your test pass? Wouldn't it be nice if it were tied to a nice continuous integration system? That's CodeChip. They run your code. If all your tests pass, they deploy your code automatically. For fast, free continuous delivery, check them out at CodeChip.com. Continuous delivery made simple. This episode is sponsored by Rackspace. Are you looking for a place to host your latest creation? Want terrific support, high performance, all backed by the latest open source cloud? What if you could try it for free? Try out Rackspace at rubyrogues.com slash Rackspace and get a $300 credit over six months. That's $50 per month at rubyrogues.com slash Rackspace. Snap is a hosted CI and continuous delivery that is simple and intuitive. Snap's deployment pipelines deliver fast feedback and can push healthy builds to multiple environments automatically or on demand. Snap integrates deeply with GitHub and has great support for different languages, data stores, and testing frameworks. Snap deploys your application to cloud services like Heroku, DigitalOcean, AWS, and many more. Try Snap for free. Sign up at snapci.com slash rubyrogues. Hey everybody and welcome to episode 197 of the Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel we have David Brady. Hello from Saratoga Springs. Jessica Kerr. Good morning. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. I just want to give you a quick reminder to go check out the Kickstarter campaign for the Rails videos. devchat.tv slash kickstarter. We also have a special guest this week and that's Justin Searles. Hello everyone. You want to introduce yourself Justin? I can try. I'm a developer. I live in Columbus, Ohio. I help run a distributed slash virtual software agency called Test Double. Uh, we're about 20 people or so at this point, and uh, we're just doing you know great work for clients all around the country building custom software. I like to write open source. I talk at a lot of conferences, um, love engaging with the community. I tweet a lot about how awful I am at writing code and other things, like bad flight itineraries. Yeah, and that's uh, pretty much 80% of my life. Awesome. Well, we brought you on today to talk about the social coding contract, which is uh, a talk that you gave at RubyConf. Was it RubyConf? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Last year. I watched the talk, but I didn't pay attention to where it came from. Um, like like uh, why I put it together? No, I, I didn't pay attention to which conference you gave it at. Ah, uh, right. Yeah, I'm curious about where it came from as far as, you know, what prompted you to put that talk together in particular. I think two things. One, like a lot of people, I'd attempted in the pre-GitHub era, I'd attempted to participate in open source, you know, submit patches or like maybe gain some notoriety by putting out some open source. But it was just so difficult to break through one by one in each of these communities mailing lists to get like, you know, repo set up and get commit bit or whatever it was necessary or sending patch files and stuff like that. It was just really difficult to. But then GitHub so dramatically lowered the barrier of entry that like a lot of us who had that kind of that itch, just started pushing stuff. And some of that stuff, we just got lucky. And uh, we never went through like a proper series of tutorials and trainings on how to be a proper open source maintainer. And um, making it up as we go along was fine for a while. But like once you've seen the same kind of patterns emerge over the course of maintaining several projects, like you're really excited, you're on the up and up, things are getting more and more popular, you're getting some attention, that stuff is all easy to manage. But what's harder to manage is when a project does what it needs to do and you still get peppered with all these like issues and distractions and stuff on the slow descent into maybe you don't even use this project anymore, but it still occupies a massive amount of your nights and weekends because other people do, expecting your help for free. So reflecting on all of that, I just felt like there was a lot there that we could talk about culturally and then combine it with the fact that all of these tools have made it so easy to slurp in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dependencies, direct and transitive, that we sometimes have lost sight of the cost of that convenience. Justin, 
one thing that you said in your talk, you mentioned all these transitive dependencies going down and down and down. You said that the application that we are required to support and understand is not just the code we wrote. It's everything we push into production. It's all of those dependencies and their transitive dependencies. And you used the phrase understanding debt for any open source thing that you pull in, any technology that you bring in, and you don't know exactly what it's doing, and you don't know exactly what it works or how to use it properly. I love that phrase. It's not technical debt in the sense that we could refactor and reorganize some stuff and fix it. It's understanding debt. It's something in our head that is going to bite us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can think of it from the perspective of, like, pre-Rails, right? Like, before Rails, I had to keep so much minutia about a project in my head uh, when I was doing a web application, like configuration details, like the one-off build stuff that I had going on, all of the, you know, like the way that I happened to organize, you know, my, my models use controllers or whatever. All of that cruft was just sort of a carrying cost of every project. When I had Rails... I kind of had this new privilege to outsource my understanding of a lot of the, those machinations. You know, I don't need to know how Rails' configuration works uh, in order to just use Rails or how its rake tests are written and so forth. So that's not necessarily to say, like, it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a fact that, like, we're so much more productive now because we have all these awesome dependencies that do so much work for us. We're shipping bigger and more complex stuff that does more more quickly with smaller teams. But I think that we sometimes fail to acknowledge, you know, that taking in 50 dependencies that does 50 different things for us, each one of those represents uh, something that we probably could do ourselves. And if we were to do it ourselves, we'd understand it a lot better. And what are we losing by not understanding either how it's doing its job or what exactly it's doing? That's really interesting. You bring up the part that you were in this before Rails and you did all those things that Rails does for you. So you have that understanding of many of the things that you're not doing anymore, but you do kind of understand how they work. I've experienced that, like, I started in C and then moved to Java, and I can tell a difference between people who started in Java. Pass by value, pass by reference is a hard concept, but when you come from C, it's totally not. And Java does the garbage collection for me, and Ruby does that too. But if you've ever had to allocate your own memory, then you, like, you appreciate that. And yeah, yeah, it's totally. totally helpful. I think that I like to visualize it like a Jenga tower, almost. I, I, I think Yehuda in his Rails Comp talk last year kind of talked about this like it was a skyscraper, and every you know subsequent generation of developers are sort of building on a firmer foundation than they than came before it. Or um, just taller. Yeah, or just taller. <laughs> uh, it, is, it is taller regardless of whether or not it's better. But I like to think of it as a Jenga tower just because of how shaky. Uh, it becomes as we lose that understanding beneath us because it's not something that just was ever intentionally built. We're standing on top of all this stuff and each subsequent generation only really knows its own experience. So when I see like people starting brand new today with no prior software development experience, like my temptation is to teach them all the stuff that I had to learn along the way, but that would take them years and years and years and would be totally unfair to them. At a certain point, we just have to acknowledge like, I didn't know the stuff underneath me when I started, and somehow things worked out okay. Figuring, And maybe that's just one aspect of why it's so easy to lose the beginner's mindset in software, because everything's moving so quickly that it's hard to even empathize with the point in that tower where, where beginners who are starting in 2015 are standing so much higher than you were at the same level in, in your journey. Exactly. I feel like I was really lucky to get into software development before there was GitHub and before there was NoSQL. And before there were all these different things to um, start at that higher level. And I got the opportunity to at work build up to that slowly. And today that background is way harder to get. Yeah. Do you feel, do you feel though that that would have been true? Like with somebody 10 years prior, you know, like being grateful that they got to stand just a little bit earlier than you did. Is it something that like every subsequent generation will say like, Oh man, I'm glad I started so low on this totem pole relative to the people after me. Uh, somewhat, but there's a matter of degree, and there's a whole open source movement really changed the game. And I got in there before that. So I got paid to learn C, and I got paid to learn Java when it was only Java and not a zillion libraries on top of it. It really, the, the exponential growth in the software that we're expected to use and there's no flipping way we can understand all the software that we're expected to use in order to put together an application these days. Um, that really took off. 
after I started, and I'm grateful for that. I mean, in 99, when I started programming, I didn't have a cell phone. I existed for a couple years. And the internet was pretty new. It's totally... I think there are some trade-offs, though. I mean, you know, it's it's definitely nice to understand the stuff that everything else is built on. So, for example, I mean, I came up, I started programming in Pascal and whatever version of BASIC was on my TI calculator when I was in junior high or high school, I don't remember. But, you know, then in college, you know, we did Java, C++, and C. Of course, the C was all in my engineering classes, not my computer science classes. But coming up through there, in some ways, it was nice when we were learning some of the higher level concepts with Java because you didn't have to worry about all of the extra things. So you could just focus on specific areas of programming. And then the flip side was, was that when you got into C and you started to understand, okay, these are kind of the building blocks that go into this C and C++, you kind of pick up, okay, you know, these are the tricks that are going on. These are the things that the system is doing for me that I don't have to do when I'm in a higher level language. And so learning Java first or learning C first, I don't know. I mean, it seems like there is the trade-off, but the trade-off is, is it does it get enough out of my way to where I can learn these concepts in a little bit safer environment versus the other way where I get a deep understanding of the system because if not, I'm going to cause myself problems. I, th- I think it's we have to be careful about certain things that have been solved for us and certain things that have just been papered over and passed forward as if they have been solved. And that's mm-hmm. when you get into like leaky abstractions and it's always fun. <laughs> I, I remember back in like 2009 discovering the SICP lectures and listening to people talk in 1986 about things in computer science that are still problems today, and they were still problems in 2009, and nobody knew about them. And I was very angry that I had been programming, you know, I started programming in the mid-80s, and I had gotten all the way to almost 2010 without hearing about the concepts that these guys were teaching in an entry-level programming class at MIT in 1986. And I was very, very angry about this. And I kind of, I went through that, we all go through that moment where you think that like all of programming is just a racket. And that was my moment. Like, like I was like Hulk smash on the keyboard that, you know, why are we, you know, that sort of thing. And so I I do think there's, there's stuff that we come into, like, like Java has so many libraries now, right? It has so many now that you just can't be a depth first programmer in Java, right? It's, it's like, if you need to do something in Java, you have to be a breadth first programmer because somebody's almost certainly written a library already to do mostly what you need. And you should go find that and repurpose it for what you need. But then there's also stuff that you run into, like the cap theorem ain't going away, people. You can't write a library that's going to make that go away, that's going to make that trade-off vanish. And so we have people that are building stuff that are trying to scratch their itch when what they're, you know, it's, it's kind of like instead of drilling down a layer in this or 20 layers in the skyscraper, we've knocked a hole in the wall and plummeted to our deaths just for fun because we decided, oh, I'm going to write this thing that's going to solve this problem. And, oh, yeah, it turns out that in order to solve this problem, I have to prove that, you know, P equals NP or whatever, which you know, we can't do yet. I think that you really get at what I was about to say, too, which is that I'm always very careful of framing things as, like, dichotomies when they don't necessarily need to be. Like, I think it's totally okay for a beginner to start now with practical stuff. You know, fast feedback loops, make progress, get some a little bit of experience with application development, uh, you know, just make some forward progress, maybe even get to the point of, like, you know, shipping some open source libraries and, and understanding, you know, kind of the craft as it exists for most developers today. But what I think would be a shame is if they lived exclusively at the top of that skyscraper for decades of their right. career without spending time diving down and starting to understand the layers beneath them. And the longer that you hold off on that, I think the greater sense of, of shock and frustration like you experienced, David. Mm-hmm. That's a great point. And Chuck, I completely agree. I mean, I feel lucky that I got to learn this stuff while getting paid for it when I was just a nine to five developer and never put in any extra time. You do not need to learn that stuff in order. It is totally reasonable. Like for instance, David, I bet if that if you had had that introductory programming course as an introduction to program programming, you would not have appreciated those problems the way you do now. This is true. This is true. 
I literally did, right? Like, I, I, I learned most, like, I had a little bit of programming experience before my computer science major, but, like, most of what I learned was, that was when I was focused on it. And it was right over my head because of how not practical it was, how the theory just did not map to any sort of concrete concept from my own experience. Like, I'm totally 100% certain that if I'd started my computer science, um, you know, program when I was in my late 20s, I would have actually gotten a lot out of it. Um, so if I'd started with SICP, I probably would have washed out <laughs> at MIT. <laughs> yeah. Related question. Justin, uh, you have 20 something developers working for you at Test Double. How much time did they spend outside of work on learning about programming? That is a great question. One that I am also curious to know the answer about. Um, I think that part of the story of Test Double is that we started the company, a lot of us, have previous consulting experience. And Testable is about three years old now. And we started the company primarily as a reaction to what we saw as a failure of other consultancies to just trust expert developers to figure out the how to do what they do instead of controlling a lot of those constraints, like you're going to use this technology, work in this place on these hours uh, with these libraries and this approach and this process get rid of a lot of those arbitrary constraints so that, they, that naturally the conversation with our clients will focus on, you know, like the, the actual constraints, like what's their budget? What do they want to build? What do the users need? And that's been hugely successful. And the way that we frame that a lot is in terms of developer autonomy. So we like, you know, we don't micromanage people very much at all, which means that I kind of don't have a lot of insight into how people spend their time on a granular basis. My sense is, and my hope is that we're constantly reinforcing to people that like we bill on a weekly rate, but that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, our clients get every hour of every day. Um, a lot of our time should be spent improving ourselves, helping each other out, learning, contributing to open source, uh, engaging with the community. And I think that our people just like after a couple months of feeling a little wary <laughs> about managing their own schedule, they just kind of fall into whatever rhythm they think suits them at that time. And I go through all sorts of seasons with this. I spend, you know, a couple months a year just heads down on talks. I spend a couple months a year really passionate about learning stuff. And I spend probably six months a year where I'm just like, wake up every day and so thirsty to do awesome client work. There's a different cadence, I think, for everybody just based on where they're at. You said you bill at a weekly rate, not an hourly rate. Yeah, you know, uh, we we found that forcing people to kind of like log really, really, because you want to be accurate and honest, I mean, just basic ethics with every bit of time that you bill at whatever granularity. But we, what we continually found is like, well, what happens if my best ideas are in the shower or in the car or between things or late at night outside office? We wanted to kind of, you know, allow people to not have to micromanage the 15 minute increments throughout their day. And then additionally, we we decided that like, like, let's say you want to spike out some code at work, right? You like you have an idea, like maybe if I spent three hours researching this, I could save two weeks later, but I still have to invest that three hours now and maybe nothing will come of it. If you're on an hourly rate, I feel like the right thing to do is to ask permission for that from your client, but your client's like in the least position, like the worst position possible to make that assertion for you. Like they, they don't have the technical knowledge to, to make that decision. Uh, and it just leads to all this sort of awkward local optimizations where it's like, well, I, I'll keep my head down and just keep on cranking. But on a weekly rate, what we found is just like it's a lot more friendly, a lot more collaborative. People act as if they're on just one team together. And a lot of that sort of micro negotiations fade away. That is fantastic. Yeah, I've been thinking lately that tracking how much time we spend on stuff is possibly a distraction that really the, I certainly feel this at work, that the limit is more about my creplets of time and of attention rather, of like brain power. That's what I run out of. It's not ours. So I think that's that's fantastic. Well, it's working thing, really well for us. The other thing that I found, so uh, I'm doing a weekly billing project right now, and I've done a couple of fixed bids, and it's much easier to align the value that you're giving your client with things when it's not hourly, when it's weekly or fixed bid, because ultimately then you know, they can look at it and they can say, okay, well, given this timetable or given this particular arrangement, I'm going to get the value and I know approximately what I'm going to pay for it. And I'm happy with that. And so you're not, they don't feel like you're nickel and diming them over any hours. You know, it's just, okay, I got a reasonable amount of work done for what I'm paying for the week. I think that I'm just generally cautious whenever a business person asks me for a metric or is interested in one, because it's so easy for, and using like hours, for example, as a metric of something, or, uh, you know, a popular whipping boy is estimations. 
or maybe like if you're on a scrum team, like your sprint points velocity, because it's so easy once you have a lot of metrics to sort of like use those lagging indicators as decision makers arbitrarily. Ours, I think, go just hand in hand with estimates in my perspective of like, you really ought to be asking like, by doing this activity and logging this and, and, and transmitting this information, you know, what decisions am I enabling you to make? And if the answer is none, then maybe that information isn't actually useful. Maybe it's even a, a distraction. One of the best ways I've found to expose the distrust as distrust inherent in like micro logging of time and that sort of thing is to ask upfront for an estimate and a budget for time tracking. As in, what time code do you want me to put filling out timesheets under? And invariably, the person in charge of the budget will go, well, I just want that to get done. Ah, okay. So this is inherently based on mistrust or a disbelief of the metrics that we have here. You want us to track stuff and spend time doing this, but you don't want to track the time spent doing this. Do you yeah, but, but you, don't, you, don't, you don't value it enough to measure it. Right. And bringing it up is often met with suspicion and distrust of why would we pay you to track your time? Or, you know, why, why would you punish us for, you know, having you track your time? Well, what do you mean punish us? Well, you're making us pay for your time entry. Yes. Yes, I am. Because you're asking for a metric. And I, I like your version better, where you basically say, what decision does this enable you to make? And cause it's a lot less confrontational, which is probably a better idea. <laughs> One of the things that you brought up in your talk, I want to kind of go back to that, was the idea that you didn't have to understand everything underneath you, but there was a trade-off there. And we kind of talked about this before. But the thing is, is that in a lot of cases, it's way more convenient to not have to understand that stuff. And so I'm curious, you know, at what point does it really hurt you to not understand the stuff that you're building on top of, you know, the, those transitive dependencies that you have. I think you raise a really good point because ultimately, like, I don't know if I, uh, if I want to call him out by name. Yeah, I will. Okay. So, so, so I look up to Gary Bernhardt a lot. I think he's done a lot of just unbelievably fantastic work and, and his talks and his, and what he's published has opened my eyes to a lot of the kind of systemic problems that we face. But sometimes in like, you know, my mind's eye version of Gary, I don't think this is real Gary. I wonder whether or not, like, if you could just perfectly see, like, that entire depth and that entire web of complexity, and sometimes as I approach that or as I get closer to that, as I kind of investigate and introspect this stuff more, it can be crippling, right? Sometimes I, I, I spend so much time talking about the systemic issues facing this bit of code that I'm looking at that I don't, and I can't actually write the code. I can't actually focus anymore, and I'm, I'm, it's completely counterproductive. And that's, you know, being an armchair analyst <laughs> of the broader situation is not, you know, typically what people are paying us for, and it can be counterproductive. So I think that there's a really important balance and budgeting both the time that we spend, you know, just trying to be productive and trying to better understand the world that we live in is something that everyone just has to find a way to strike on their own. So there's a good follow-up question to that, which is, I, I hear this argument frequently. That in fact, there's a, an interview question that I used to use a lot, which is, would you rather use somebody else's framework or write your own and why? And I remember years ago, this is back when Chuck and I worked at Crime Reports together, we passed on a candidate because he was very senior. He was very skilled. He absolutely could do the job. But his answer was absolutely no compromise. I have to write the framework. And I, I said, why? And I said, because you never really understand something until you write it. And I'm like, well, okay, that's a, a pretty fair argument. But as, as we talked about it and more and more, this person had no concept. I, I finally just asked him point blank, once you write the framework, why should I use your framework instead of somebody else's? Now that I'm not you, why should anybody else on the team not write their own framework, you know, in order to understand it? And he didn't have a good answer. He, he got kind of angry about it. And that's actually why we flunked him in the interview was it was more of a psych eval than a, than a skill set thing. But huh. there's a time when reusing stuff to me is absolutely the smartest thing to do. And there's also a time when ripping the hood off this sucker and grabbing your toolkit and just tearing apart the guts of this thing and going all the way to the bottom, maybe rewriting it, but certainly tearing the engine apart is absolutely the right thing to do, right? It, the the if, correct answer to your interview question is, of course, it depends, right? It depends, sure. And I'm, I'm setting you up to answer this same kind of question, right? There's this need to understand the skyscraper, and sometimes you have to go all the way down to the bedrock, right? I mean, you have to go all the way freaking down to registers at the CPU or even to transistors, 
you know, the, the blew my mind the first time an electrical engineer showed me how electrons could turn into ones and zero. I mean, it just absolutely opened my eyes to things. But some days you don't need to do that. And I would ask you, you know, as we talk about things about like the social coding contract, when do we pop the hood and tear the engine apart? And when do we pop the hood and build our own engine? And when do we just leave the hood on and use the engine that somebody else has written for us? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that there's a, a little bit of nuance here because oh, absolutely. When, when I'm in that interview with that candidate and he says he wants to build his own framework, I'm not necessarily thinking about the technical merits of when it's worthwhile to go down to the transistor level. What yeah. I'm thinking, or even the, like, I am thinking about the team dynamics, but what I'm fundamentally thinking about as like, you know, a business consultant is like, so what's the business case? Like uh, presuming you're going to build this framework on somebody else's dime for them to be completely blocked and unproductive until you can like go from zero to 60 on building your own engine all over again. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's led me to, you know, and maybe it's because, um, like our particular brand of consulting is we view ourselves first as business consultants. It's kind of like working outside in on a technical problem, only we pop the stack another level and we really ask, like, what's the business value that you're trying to get? Or, like, what real-world constraints are you under? Because those tend to drive more. Two different business situations could completely steer you towards, man, for your budget and your timeline, what you are best served by is us re-permuting your vision a little bit so that it can fit a cookie-cutter CRUD Rails app with traditional views. Whereas maybe we can, like, you know, have another business client who's got just a slightly different a set of requirements where it's like, man, if we can just make this one very special, different, unusual thing that isn't served well by a, you know, a library that solves a very common problem, if we could just write a custom thing that meets your needs narrowly, but really well, then you could really succeed in this market where somebody with just the Rails CRUD app couldn't. You know, that's right. almost always, it's not a technical problem that should be steering that. It's a, at it least a so, insofar as we're doing it for our profession. Yeah, I think it's, the business realities that drive that. Yeah. And I, I'm going to lob you a softball here. Have you ever had a client where you've gone in and in the early game, they've got to get to market fast, but in the long game, they absolutely need a custom framework. And so you say, okay, we're going to stand this up on rails. We're going to throw a lot of iron at it, you know, a whole lot of CPUs and a whole lot of stuff. And that's going to get you revenue. But in the next 12 months, you have to rewrite the entire rail stack for what you need. But you call that a softball, but man, each, some of those conversations can just be excruciating up front in process and, and later because, um, uh, I didn't say I was going to throw the soft, I wasn't going to throw the softball at your head. <laughs> well, you know, like you're right. Um, we've had several clients who've come to us looking for, you know, what they might call a prototype or an MVP. Lots of our clients come in for that. Um, and we are more than happy to abide by the constraints they're under, you know, not a uh, gold plate stuff, maybe not, you know, test as rigorously as we would because it's got zero users. And if it breaks, it's not the end of the world. That kind of thing for an MVP can be really appropriate. And if you're really gifted, I think that like there is a path by which you can go from that MVP and typically refactor your way into a successful long-term system. But we've had one or two occasions where we've just... I've literally sat down with like a, the director of a company and just said, please give me permission to delete this repository on this date, which was about a year out. And we'll keep working on it for you up until that date. But you're going to like not literally sign, but maybe should have promise me I can delete it at this point because it's just not sustainable. And I promise you it's not in your best interest to keep on trying to tack stuff onto this thing because mm -hmm. it's changed so often as you've revalidated your business. Like it needs to be rewritten at that point. If we see that coming, we just try to be as upfront about that as possible. Mm -hmm. I think it's fantastic. There's a, a quote that our, our CEO likes to throw around, Matt Scantlin. He likes to say that uh, a dirty code base is the sign of a well-monetized application. And <laughs> when, when, you, when you see people just scrambling you know, to get that next feature out, that next feature out, the next feature out, you're like, okay, somebody's making money here or somebody's desperate to, <laughs> to not burn through their startup capital. But I, I like that, that. Sometimes the right answer is to just keep the goose that's laying the golden eggs, keep that goose alive, and just refactor, refactor, you know, refactor that ugly duckling into a swan to say, stay with the avian metaphor. But sometimes the right thing to do is just slash and burn and start over or you know, replace it side by side as you go. These are all fun nuances, and it comes back to, let me, let me rephrase the original question. When you don't know the framework that you're going into, should you pick up an existing one or should you write one from scratch when you understand all the principles behind it? Just said something a minute ago that I think relates to this. 
He mentioned that directs clients sometimes in two different ways. One was for a standard app on a standard framework, and the other one was for a narrow custom app, one that meets your needs and exactly your needs. Yeah. And I'm wondering, my, my impression from that is that maybe the phrase custom framework should be an oxymoron. Yeah, yeah, and actually, uh, you answered uh, my sentiment when I was going Ugh, to to David's question really, <laughs> really well. Um, and I think I think that's exactly it. it. Only every decade, an ember comes along or a Rails comes along that tries to solve a very broad set of problems that are so common that that broad framework is warranted, right? Like if there were only ten projects out in the world that needed to be written in a manner like Ember enables, then Ember itself wouldn't be worth it. Ten one-off frameworks by ten one-off engineering teams would be preferable to having all of this community and all of this hullabaloo in an annual conference. But if it's something that, like, you know, we feel like the web is moving this way and tons and tons of applications are going to be built with the concept of, like, the browser as the runtime, and we need a UI kit for that, suddenly, like, that big framework makes a lot of sense. Like, I don't think there are very many, like, individual corporations at this point. I think you have to be, like, Facebook, Google, Apple big to really need your own application framework, anything that's worthy of the title capital F framework. Right. At that point, you've got so many developers working for you on this framework that it's approximately public. But I, what, what does every startup come and say, you know, like, get some funding? That we want a platform. We want to be totally different and distinct. And I think it's just important to separate the technical aspect and the implementation detail of that from maybe the business reality. Um, there was a question earlier of when does that understanding debt come back to bite you? When does it hurt you to use tools that you don't completely understand? And there, there's some obvious answers to that. Like as soon as your ORM starts doing N plus one queries and your performance tanks, sure, that's, yeah. yeah, that's bitten you. Or in our case, it's when Elasticsearch runs out of memory because we're querying it in the wrong way, ways it's not suited for and was never designed to do. You don't know when it's going to bite you, which is exactly the problem because that understanding debt represents a huge chunk of uncertainty. Well, there's two vectors by which we don't understand our dependencies. Uh, maybe three. One is, what are our dependencies? <laughs> you know, like, part of the talk is really trying to make the case that we understand direct dependencies super duper well, and we never spend any time visualizing our transitive dependencies. That is to say, if you're not familiar with the term, our dependencies are of our dependencies. And so, since we don't know they exist, of course we don't know how they work or what they're doing. Uh, but even once you get over the first hurdle of understanding what's out there, what's underneath me, what am I standing on? The second question of what it's doing is separate from how does it work? Um, and I think that it's easier to like research and, and maybe the responsible thing to do is be pretty thorough in vetting what, what is it doing? How does Elasticsearch work? How does our ORM boil down all of its cool Ruby syntax into SQL statements? Uh, or not how, but that it does as opposed to understanding the exact minutia of how it does its job, right? Which is a much deeper, harder question. Yeah, that's what you want to abstract away, right? Right. But you do need to know what it's good at, and please, please, please know what it's not good at. That was our mistake with Elasticsearch. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of times you do wind up learning those uh, lessons as you go. And I think a lot of the times you can't know what's going to bite you when, so you just wait till something does, and then dig in. Then actually spend some time learning it. Don't just paper over it. Well, and, and unfortunately, you know, people usually take the easy route. Like, the hard route is diving in deep and learning it, and the easy route is, uh, you know, use the phrase bitten, like, once bitten, twice shy. You know, to, like, look at that thing and be like, well, that sucks. I'm going to go switch over to this other NoSQL thing uh, and just continually flip-flop across almost partisan lines of whether it's the language or the ecosystem or, or the framework or a particular library. Like, how often has a gem let you down or something? And then you decided, like, well, I'm going to go Google the other gems that do the same thing. And you find yourself just kind of like, you know, grass is always greener affecting <laughs> blame to different the tool, dependencies. Right, yeah. Exactly. Or even better, blame the open source maintainer. Yeah, I get a little bit of that. <laughs> I like that solution. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, it, it is a pretty common thing, right, where, you know, somebody comes in and leaves a, you know, an issue on GitHub or something like that and does put the burden back on the maintainer where in reality they just didn't use it correctly. Do you see a lot of that, Justin? A little bit. You know, I think 
I would be very careful to dis, I don't want to discourage anyone from engaging on right. something like GitHub because it takes a lot of effort to put yourself out there, put your own code out there, even just to like, you know, if the maintainer of a certain thing is disproportionately well known in the community to you, like it, it can take some courage to put yourself out there. I think the most important thing is we check ourselves against a sense of entitlement, like we're customers when we're not when we're posting uh, an issue. And if we just act with kindness and an appropriate level of deference in terms of like, hey, this is just a question. Maybe it's a stupid question. Could you help me out and refocus me? I think that's 100% valid. And I love those emails. The issues that worry me are when somebody, you know, makes immediate demands on my time as if it, as if their urgency is now my responsibility. And it's a weekend and I'm in the park with my wife. And now I'm sweating bullets because I feel like I just let somebody down on the internet. <laughs> That's a great point, and it's really important that part of being a responsible open source user is when we have a problem, put that information out there as a GitHub issue on the mailing list. Let people know that you had the problem. I mean, best case, you get a solution out of it. Worst case, that's information that people can use. Yep. Most of our documentation in like uh, uh, Lineman is the one coming to mind. Jasmine Rails is another project where people will open the same issue 10 times or somebody will open the issue first and then I'll get 10 plus ones. And it's not an issue with the, the software necessarily, but there's an easy workaround that we just failed to document. And so I've had times where I've literally just moved advice from the bottom of a readme progressively higher up the readme <laughs> to decrease the number of people. Because I can't expect everyone's going to read the entire readme even. I don't think it, even that's fair. Just to understand, you know, as that data comes in, how we can better serve the users. And at that point, it's not bothersome. It's helpful. Yeah, absolutely. What else can people do to be responsible users of open source software? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I'll tell you a story, and maybe we can link to this in the show notes. Uh, last week, I had a very kind gentleman send me a pull request out of the blue to add a significant new feature to uh, a gem that I've got. And effectively, what it would do is it's like a totally different mode of operation. So like the 80% main chunk of work this thing does, uh, it would have just branched at that point with an optional configuration, do something totally different, but still completely like from a user's perspective, just as valid. And A, we didn't have an issue. B, you know, we hadn't discussed it already. C, it just, it was long and it changed a lot of kind of like little style points and other unrelated things like readme and attribution and stuff. And when it came over the fence, I was like immediately offended by its very existence because I didn't expect it. And then by, uh, you know, virtue of like, now I'm going to have to maintain this branched code forever because I have to test for it. You know, like I, I as a maintainer have seen this show before and, and I know how it ends where I have like a whole bunch of like PRs accepted for this one-off optional stuff that I end up maintaining code that's no longer used by anybody anymore because uh, I don't know. And so uh, what I ended up doing was just try to give him like in the gentlest possible way the feedback about like what it's like to receive a PR like that. And, uh, you know, he responded with utmost grace and understood my point and, you know, decided he would just fork or and create his own gem with a different theme and, and host that himself. Uh, and couldn't have been happier with the outcome. Like, you know, like how often does a comment thread leave you feeling really great <laughs> about that type of interaction? So by that story, one thing I got out of that story was that you would have been happier initially if the interactions had started smaller. Right, because you think of it in terms of like amount of investment. If somebody spends, you know, a ton of time invested in building this pull request, you know, meticulously making every line of code perfect, it doesn't matter if it was the best, well, like the most well-built thing ever. If it's the wrong thing, or if it's unexpected and undesired by the person who's going to receive it, that just makes it even harder to reject it, right? So when I got like a large pull request that I didn't expect, it made it even harder for me to break the bad news that I didn't think it was a good fit, because now I felt like I was just not valuing his level of investment. If that makes any sense. Um, it does make sense. I mean, if somebody sent a pull request to one of my projects, and, you know, it was a large pull request. My issue would mostly be that I don't have a lot of time to go and review it. Not necessarily even, you know, whether or not it fit well. You know, I want to spend my time adding value and doing good stuff for the community and things like that. And it, it's hard to take the time out to do that. 
you know, to go review a pull request when, A, I don't know if it's even going to be accepted or essentially worth the time to do. And the second thing is, is that I don't know if I have enough hours to string together to really understand the code. I mean, under the surface, it's a social problem, right? Like two people who don't know each other, who aren't talking to each other, who have no sense of community or collective ownership of something, slinging code over the fence and expecting a good result seems like a ridiculous notion. And yet that's exactly how GitHub is set up to operate from a technical perspective. Um, I think that if we're good at inviting collaborators early in a project when it's still on the up and up, it's still small, it's still growing, um, and, and establishing like a broad net of people who are familiar with the implementation levels of, of our libraries, the downstream, the descent is much less painful as a result. Because you know, on Lineman, for example, several of our people at Testable know it really, really well. And every issue that comes in, it's, you know, there's five or six people who could very well respond to that. We can share the burden of, of that kind of stuff. It's not all on one person. A library isn't just code, it's a community. Right. But a lot of developers aren't, you know, necessarily signing up for that when they just push a one off thing that they need onto the internet, right? Because who knows whether or not you, it, anyone's ever going to use it other than you. Um, and, and I think it's just, uh, it's there's a certain pattern where certain folks like somebody like TJ Holloway Chuck will go and make like a bajillion very useful node modules. And there's no way that he could even act as sort of like a commander at the very top over top all of the other little sub communities that form. You're just like a Johnny Appleseed of all these different libraries out there. And that's certainly one pattern of engagement, but it's a double edged sword because there's no way that you're going to be able to, at a certain point you have so much baggage in the, in the form of code out there that you could never possibly do a new thing. You're, you're so beholden to helping and supporting others using your existing stuff. So what can you do that at that point that's short of disappearing? I mean, if you're trying to build a little bit of community early, obviously you can like seek out a new maintainer, broaden it out, and notify people even, you know, hey, this is unmaintained, maybe stop adopting it. <laughs> you know, stem the tide a little bit. A lot of times, like, putting out scary phrases like, this is an unmaintained thing now, will itself be a good call to action. I'm not exactly, like, an example that I'm not exactly sure maps directly to this, but, like, CanCan, when Ryan Bates decided to, like, not maintain it anymore, I'm not sure what level of communication occurred, but it was clear at some point he wasn't going to maintain it anymore. Can, can, can emerged, you know? And I don't think that anything like that sort of groundswell of community involvement would have happened uh, had it not been abundantly clear that the maintainers... And there it is again, it's communication. Funny how that works. <laughs> well, it's it's interesting, too, because I've seen projects where somebody kind of blessed somebody else or, you know, anointed them the new maintainer. And then there's the other project where the maintainer basically just stops maintaining it. And so then somebody else forks it and starts maintaining it. And then you wind up with three or four unofficial forks until one of them eventually wins out. I've also seen it, though, where somebody forks it because it's been unmaintained for six months or a year, and then the maintainer comes back and updates it. Yeah. I mean, and and again, it it all comes back to communication. Like, I personally think that when you end up with 10 forks that are all divergent from each other of the same project, one that comes to mind is uh, GitX, a GUI for using Git on the Mac. And it does a disservice. It's a failure state to me because to the end user, it's completely confusing what the right way to use it is. Like, do I, what's the best fork? I guess I have to read all of these divergent forks. Like, there's no... A summary of the differences, you know, like if I had fork eight out of all of these other forks, I'd be talking to the other people who wrote the forks and be like, I'm going to merge in your stuff so we can make one new meta thing. Uh, or I'm at least going to write a summary of the difference and, and the different focuses of all these things. But in general, what we see is this: like, there's all these forks out there and they all have a random smattering of commits on them. And it, we're now pushing the cost of understanding the unmaintained state of this thing onto each and every single user, which is seems to me incredibly inefficient. GitX actually solves a really interesting problem in a really int- evil way. <laughs> At a coworker who we were switching away from subversion and we were investigating all the various things out there. And I proposed Git and he put his foot down and he said, uh, I can use anything as long as I don't have to learn a command line client. Because he was very UI centered. He was a designer and actually he was a developer, but he was very, you know, Mac OS X, you know, and never opened a terminal for anything, had GUI clients for everything. And I said, okay, sure. Here's GitX. Go for it. Or get, I, I think, yeah, I gave him GitX and he opened up GitX and went, this is awful. And I said, well, there's also GitK, which is even worse. 
and it solved the problem because it gave him a, a, a GUI. And six months later, we were pairing, and he needed to do something like fiddle around with the ref log or something like that. And he was doing it all from the, and like fiddling around with the ref log. You already know this person has mastered the command line client, right? And Git internals. And, yeah. And and that I hate to say it, but GitX's purpose, I think, is to drive people away from GUI clients and into the arms of the the, the loving arms of the command line client. And I just realized I totally just slammed the GitX project and everybody that's on it. And guys, I'm sorry. We love you because. Th- we need more things to make Git simpler and, 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 and more user friendly. Yeah, at that particular time, this was back in 2010, 2009 or so. And it served the purpose very well, which was to drive somebody to the command line client. I, st- I still use GitX all the time. Uh, now that we're talking about GitX, I, mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, uh, but as a user, I have to, uh, figure out which fork I'm on on each and every one of my machines. It's like, I like sure. the row, the row on J one. I found to be the best maintained. <laughs> it's got Sparkle mm-hmm. updates and it seems to work really well. I love visual. I'm just a very visual person. I like being able to individually use my mouse and like stage this line and not that line. Yeah. And so yes. for like the very basic workflow, I like GitX a lot. But the obviously, staging, you can't escape the command line. Staging by hunks is freaking awesome with a GUI client and freaking painful with a command line client. And that's absolutely true. Right. We, we, we talked earlier in the show about using something and then it breaks. And then we just kind of drunkenly reel to the other party, you know, and say, you know, this sucks, this rules, and now we're just going to switch. And I just realized that I'm unfairly doing that to GitX because my, like a lot of developers who came up through the Microsoft way, my introduction to source control was Visual Source Safe. And if you use this, used it distributed back in 1996 or so, there was an error message. Uh, that, like, I'm going to make five people, five of our listeners actually have a convulsion right now. When you walk in and there's a dialog box that says corrupted file in AAAAAAB.dat. When that pops up on your VSS server, what it means is you have lost your repository. There is no repair tool. I sure hope you have a backup. And all GUI tools became evil at that point. And I drunkenly reeled to the command line. That didn't help with, with Visual Source Safe. But as soon as I got out of Windows and into, oh, Subversion. Oh, wait a minute. The, and Subversion was new at the time. Before that, it was, it was CVS. And, oh, CVS is so great because it's all just text. It's all just plain. And then Subversion. And then Git was so hard and so user unfriendly back in version zero. But I came up through that. So I came up through Git when it was really hard to use. So, of course, all GUI clients are still evil. And I'm content to remain in my command line is best. And maybe that's not the most productive strategy. Maybe But not. it is the most curmudgeonly. Yes. And that's that has value uh, socially. Well... It has a value attached to it socially. <laughs> Jessica, you were talking earlier about like trying to predict change. And I like how what you kind of settled on was it's almost more important how we react to change because we can't predict. We can't predict these dependencies and we can't predict these problems. The GitHub thing, GitHub is very low ceremony, which is great if you have solved the social problem. If everybody knows each other, there's no ceremony. But if people don't know each other, you are abandoned. You have no ceremony to support you. And this, this kind of harks back a little bit to Justin, you, because the community, I think, adapts. And are there ways when, and I'm trying not to just retread how to be a good open source user, but it's specifically, I want to address this, this issue of the new person, you know, the, the new developer coming in, especially a junior developer coming into a project they want to help out or, they want to, you know, rewrite the whole thing and reinvent the cap theorem. And they don't know you know, whether like this guy that dumped this huge thing on you versus can I go through and make documentation? How do we react to that in a way like, like how can we improve our reactions? I guess is what I'm saying. So that junior people and newer people, more afraid people, th- things that, that ceremony would help with things that the social problem makes hard. How do we react to that to make those easier? Well, you know, I think that one of the big themes of my career up to this point has been that whenever you're faced with a problem, there's fundamentally two ways to act. That gets back to like Deming's common cause versus special cause. Like either you can react to everything, every problem that happens as being, uh, you know, like never again, this is terrible. We're going to like implement a process or a procedure or a ceremony. and We're going to prevent this problem from recurring. Or you can take the complete opposite approach and say like, 
you know, whenever a problem happens, it's like, whoa, we can't predict the future, guys. We just have to react really, really well, which leads, you know, to its own problems of being just too reactive and not strategic. I try to do like a, a little bit of analysis to understand, you know, what's the, was the thing that caused this problem a special case, a special cause? Like, is it just this particular person is a problem on the team, like wanting to reinvent all the wheels everywhere? Or is it a common cause? Is it like systemic? Like, beginners don't know what to do when they hit our team. Mm-hmm. And once we get past that level, like, so assuming it's a common cause issue, then we have to decide now, do we, how do we address this? Do we address that? Like, and, and, and in terms of the best prescriptions, I still try to travel really light in terms of process and ceremony because the needs of today may differ dramatically from the needs in the future, but also the processes and the, and tools like something like GitHub, we've been talking about GitHub a lot. I think that GitHub is a very lightweight flow. It's a bi-directional feedback loop. It being so easy makes me treat other people like in, in a more flippant and lightweight manner because I can just like hammer something off to them so quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I have to pause myself because of the tool has kind of coaxed me into this very casual tone. So if I'm going to try to solve a common problem like beginners can't work on the team, the first step I probably look for is like, what can we do to not just work around or ignore or deal with like the quote unquote sh- social problem. It's probably mm-hmm. just to meet them where they are and do a better job empathizing. And the best way that I found to do that is spend a lot of time with somebody. So, and that's why I think a lot of teams just immediately go to let's pair program with that junior developer a lot for a long time over a long stretch of time um, until they get their sea legs until, and whether it's a confidence issue or a competency issue, I think pairing is a great way to like, just level up. I had a fun experience on Sunday at tender love and I paired on just Vim for like two hours <laughs> and I have tried to adopt Vim like 20 times and I'm so visual and I, the, my approach to just thinking and visualizing code is so inconsistent with how Vim is popularly used that him sitting down with me, me knowing he'd spent 15 years in VI and Vim, and him having his own quirky, interesting approach to everything was just absolutely, like, eye-opening and fantastic. Like, using his editor more like a browser, really. And pairing with him did more for me in those two hours than, like, five years of angst and social anxiety, watching Vim casts and and reading and trying to, like, look at cheat sheets and stuff. I like that you basically went to the E word, right? I mean, I'm, I'm so sick of empathy, but it's really the right answer here, right? Because you can't just take a prescription and just apply it. Because if we took all the seniors and made them pair with the junior people for two hours, nine times out of 10, or maybe 99 out of 100, or maybe just two out of three, it would be a complete impedance mismatch and it would be a total waste of time. But where you had invested so much time trying to get your teeth into Vim, trying to get, you had scattered bits of knowledge, I will wager, about how Vim works. And you, sure. know, you could probably cut and paste and, you know, insert a file into an existing buffer and, and, and that kind of stuff, but not a good feel. And, and yeah, that first time you sit down and pair with somebody who really uses VI and, you know, you're hopping in and out of Vim, back to the command line, back into Vim, back into the command line. And you see them start using visual mode and start using nerd tree and you realize, okay, there's a lot more than just HJKL to Vim and you start to see it, but you can't, my, my point, and I'm sorry, I'm so rambly, but my, my point is that you can't just do that with a prescription, right? If you, if you take a new programmer and sit them down and say, okay, kid, I'm going to show you how to edit code and fire up Vim for two hours with them, they're going to walk away from that with hopefully at at most a sheet full of notes, but it's largely going to be useless to them because they weren't ready for that. And you were. And so that was the right prescription at that time. And I, given that Aaron was involved, it surprises me not at all to see that some empathy was probably involved of, you know what, let's just sit down and pair on this. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I I think that the, uh, you know, to the point earlier about where we stand on this Jenga tower, you know, like what class were we in when we started? Were we on like floor 47 and people starting now are on floor 63? Yeah. Um, What I try to do just to make the very same point is understand that I require empathy to even get, you know, like to even remember what it's like to be in a be a beginner at anything technical. And so part of the reason I decided to randomly chew off an afternoon to work on Vim stuff is because having somebody that's my senior in a particular category 
and feeling the experience of what it's like to receive instruction, even at a very elementary level, is critical to me understanding, like, when the tables are turned and I'm the more senior person, what it, the effect that my words and my tone and the things that I'm trying to convey have on the individual who's in a learning position. That's awesome. Right on. Uh, speaking of learning, something you said earlier, Justin, I wanted to highlight, you were talking about like the eight different forks and how are you supposed to figure it out? And one of the things you mentioned was at least write up the differences between different forks. And that's something else that we as open source contributors can do. And it's a small thing that can make a big difference is when you do that research, when you hit one of those problems, just blog it, blog what you found. It'll take an extra hour, but you never know. Google will magically find it and direct people to it. You don't even have to mark it. And then when you forget what you did and a year later you need that again, Google will find it for you. Totally. You know, I think that there's a theme here, which is that when communication is the problem or social relationships are the problem, it's best to err on the side of over communicating. And I think that the people that I see who struggle the most with these issues as users, they tend to be also kind of sheepish about, you know, like, how often is it the case that, like, somebody's working on some library, but they're, quote, unquote, not ready to open source it yet, or it's not ready yet to be public. You know, blogging is the exact same thing. It's You're putting yourself out there in a way, but no one's ever going to see you until you do. And so figuring out when that moment is to start pushing stuff out publicly is an impossible to answer question. That confidence is probably never going to come on its own. Uh, and so... I think the people that I've seen around me that I try to surround myself with are people who've at least buy into the idea that like defaulting to open and transparency and over communicating when things are tough, whether that means like shoot from the hip blogging, like you described, pushing up a library, opening a question, as long as we're kind to each other, I think that's always the better default state than holding it into ourselves <laughs> and developing curmudgeonly status about the state of things. And that kind of blogging is something that you can do to contribute to the community without spending a lot of time outside work. Totally. Well, absolutely. So this has been just great. Is there anything else we want to talk about on the topic of open sources before we get to picks? I'm good. This has been an awesome show. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great discussion. All right. Let's go ahead and do some picks. David, do you want to start us off with picks? Sure. I have two very awesome picks today. The first one is Royalty Free Music by Kevin McLeod. We, we've all heard snippets of Kevin's music. He started years ago just writing music and then just giving it away, like public domain giveaway. He's got a library out now. You, his website's at incompetech.com. And there's a fun little bit in there. If you go to incompetech.com, there's a little section in there on make some graph paper. And that's actually how I found out about Kevin way back in the day, years and years ago, is you can go there. You can make graph paper of any density, or you can make hexagonal paper, whatever you want, and then just print it out on the laser printer. And you've got graph paper, and you're good to go. It's freaking awesome. But he also started making music. And his only requirement is that you give him credit. So you can see a lot of game demos and a lot of like demo movies and little animations on YouTube and whatnot. And then they end with this music by Kevin McLeod. You know, like, like Zay Frank uses some of Kevin's music in some of his like the show and, you know, true facts, uh, YouTube videos and that sort of thing. So the reason I'm picking Kevin McLeod is because, and, and Kevin McLeod's music specifically, is he's been doing this for free for, oh gosh, a decade? And he finally has put together a, just a zip file, just a big old tarball of all of his MP3s. And you can get every single one of his MP3s by sifting through his website and downloading the MP3 for free. But you can go to his website and get the zip file and you can give him $49. And you notice I'm not saying that it's going to cost you this. I'm saying you now have the opportunity to give him money for what he is doing. I paid him for it. He wrote me a nice little thank you note. And I wrote him back and said, my gosh, I've been using your music for so long. I'm absolutely thrilled that I now have a chance to, to pay it forward. And I'm totally picking you on our podcast next, uh, next week. So he wants to know when it's going to go live. He's going to be listening to the podcast. Not that anybody cares, but hi, Kevin. So my tech picks for today is just royalty-free music by Kevin McLeod. Go out, get it, listen to it. You can search the site. There's great stuff. It's Most of it's loopable. If you have musical OCD when you're programming like I do, you can put on a three-minute song just on loop 
and it will loop back to itself and you can just play it until your coworkers go crazy, which is a feature in and all by, by itself. It's awesome. My second pick is something that hits a lot closer to home. Uh, I'm now working at Cover My Meds, which unfortunately does not pay for your medication. But what we do do is we sort out prior authorization so that if your insurance is supposed to be paying for your medication, we sort out all the paperwork because a lot of things don't get paid for. And the founder of our company was a pharmacist who specifically did this because of multiple sclerosis medications. If you have multiple sclerosis, you probably have an idea of how much the medications cost. But my wife is on a medication that costs $5,400 a month. And when we were on one set of insurance, it was a medical benefit and we could get it for $60 if we had prior authorization. And then we switched insurance and it became a prescription benefit. And it's a tier four medication. Those of you in the health industry know that what that means is that you have to pay 25% of the cost of the medication. Her medication went from $60 a month to more than our mortgage. And that was just 25%. And my pick today is Rebif.com. Rebif is one of the best medications available. I'm not a doctor. Don't take this as medical advice, but Rebif is one of the best medications for relapsing multiple sclerosis, which is the kind that my wife has. It's also extremely expensive. And Rebif does not want you to not be on their medication just because you can't pay for it. So I'm going to put a link in the show notes to the Rebif copay. If you don't have insurance, they will give you the medication free for a year. If you have any insurance, they will manage your copay. If you've got a 25% coinsurance, they will pay it for more than a year. They basically, they want to get your insurance paying for this and get it covered. And they want to take it care of. They want you on this medication. My wife's been off medication for two months and it has been absolutely tearing me up inside. And we just found this site and she's now back on her medications. And I am very, very happy to pick uh, Rebif. I don't know. I, I didn't think when I came on this podcast that I would chill for big pharma, but I'm absolutely in love with Rebif as a company, not just as a medication. So Rebif.com slash Rebif dash co dash pay is the site. And I'll put that in the show notes. And those are my picks. All right, Jessica, what are your picks? I have four picks, but I swear it'll take half the time of David's. <laughs> that's, that's not, that's not hard. I, in fact, I apologize to everybody that Jessica's going to take 10 freaking minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. First one is for Justin. If you haven't listened to it yet, Ruby Rogues number 88 with Peter Hintons talks a lot about how to engage people in the community and make them into contributors and, and develop that so that it's not all on you. Uh, my second pick is a bit of a shell. So at the Commercial Users of Functional Programming Conference is in Vancouver in early September, beginning of September, and the call for presentations is over. So if you have a 25-minute technical talk on something functional programming or an experience report, uh, you should submit. It'll be cool. My third and fourth picks go together. One of the things that I thought a lot about while I was watching Justin's RubyConf talk was the difference between aiming for goals, aiming for a specific feature set versus systems, aiming for good code in a code base to which we can add new features and delete useless features on an ongoing basis and learn where the success lies. So there's a good blog post on that about how aiming for something in particular can be limiting compared to aiming for a good process of getting to good places. Similarly, to go along with that, there's one on discipline versus motivation that I'll also put in the show notes. And both of these really boil down to the same thing of it's not passion, doing what you're passionate about brings success. It's having success makes you passionate about it. So at first, you just do the work and then you experience success. And if you experience success, then the passion comes along and you can keep going. So it's really about starting with something that you don't hate and working at it and then experiencing the success. And then you get the positive snowball of work, which I think also ties in with what Chuck said about um, have early success as a learner, do what makes you successful and then come back and fill in the details after you've acquired the passion. The end. Yeah, I think that ties directly into how people got into Ruby through Rails is that it was easy to get a win, and then they learned and kind of fell in love with Ruby later on. Yeah. 
All right, I've got a couple of picks. I've got a couple of books that I'm going to pick. The first one has actually been picked on the show before, but not for quite a long time. Uh, it's called The Wizard of Earthsea by Ursula Le Guin. I listened to it on Audible. I'd actually tried to read the book a couple of times in the past, and I just couldn't get into it for some reason. But listening to it worked, and I really enjoyed it. So I'm going to pick that. And another book, and this one, I, I hesitate a little bit because I know that we have varied political, you know, within the U.S. backgrounds. Um, but I thought it was really interesting. I don't know if I buy into all of the premises in the book, but I think there are definitely some things that are worth looking into and finding out how true they are and whether or not and how we want them to change. Uh, the book is called Conform. It's by Glenn Beck. And so, like I said, you know, a lot of people don't like his particular brand of conservatism. I can't, I can't imagine Glenn Beck being a controversial figure at all. So anyway, so if you're interested in that, it's about the education system in the U.S., and points out some of the problems that are out there, which I think are legitimate, and some of them which I need to explore a little bit further before I completely buy into them. But, so those are my two picks. Justin, what are your picks? Hey, I've got three picks, and only one is a shill, uh, if, you, if you guys will allow it. So, first pick, I am not a photographer, uh, but I have a ton of family pictures, and I, uh, you can basically guess what year a particular picture was taken in for, based on what model iPhone was currently out throughout my entire, like, like since 2007. And I'm continually frustrated that, like, I just don't have, you know, very many good shots uh, at a wide angle of, like, my life as I experience it, especially when you travel. So I've been in the market for a kind of, like, an entry-level, amateur-ish, not, maybe not DSLR, but something, like, of that kind of quality. And thanks to the Wirecutter's awesome review, I landed on the Sony NEX 5T mirrorless camera. Uh, if you're not familiar with the latest in camera gizmos, apparently a mirrorless camera is essentially a DSLR, but it doesn't have the internal mirror inside that enables a, like an optical viewfinder, uh, which if you're old school is probably really important to you, or if you're a proper photographer is probably really important to you. But from my perspective, just makes it so the thing is so bulky, you know, it couldn't possibly fit a pocket. They're also cheaper. So, uh, you know, I picked it up for like, I think 370 bucks on Amazon. Uh, so it's significant investment, but the pictures, especially just like of, of landscapes and of bigger scenes, uh, have been night and day versus my, you know, otherwise trusty iPhone 6. My uh, second pick uh, is that there's this conference, you guys. It's new up and coming conference called RailsConf that is uh, in April. Wait, and ra- what conf? It's uh, it's the word rail and then the word sconf. Rails. <laughs> okay. <conf. laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> never heard and, of it. Yeah, well, you know, uh, this guy named DHH is keynoting along with some also rands like Ken his, Beck. His, his name uh, is, is initials. That's yeah, funny. right. Um, that's a funny name. <laughs> so I am very, very fortunate to share that I just found out that I've been expe- accepted to speak at RailsConf. Yeah, last year was my very first one. This year, I'm I'm doing a sort of quasi parallel sequel to Social Coding Contract, the talk that we discussed today. But this one's a little bit more technical. It's focused on code. The title is "Sometimes a Controller is Just a Controller," and it's focused on the virtues of boring code. So, like last year, DHH talked a lot about software writing, the anti, you know, TDD is dead, and then a lot of backlash of like, you know, the pro craftsmanship people, um, you know, coming at the other extreme. And I felt like there was just no nuance in the middle for, like we were talking about today, like context is everything. And so my goal is to talk about some of the pitfalls of going overboard and listening to, you know talking heads like me uh, say this design is good and this design is bad. And I said, sometimes like the right thing to do is just to like put things in the right MVC bucket. So I'm really excited to start developing that talk now. And I hope that if you're you're listening and and you come to RailsConf, I'd love to meet you uh, and and, and see you there. My third pick is uh, if you like working on cars, I don't. Uh, But if you really like Apple gadgets, I do. (laughs) The Alpine ILX 007 model aftermarket radio thing is a uh, standalone CarPlay unit for your vehicle dashboard. And uh, I had a friend who works at Ford who was kind enough to drive down and spend a, you know, uh, a long night with me in the cold tinkering with my car to rip out the, uh, the factory radio and, and put in this nice, beautiful touch screen display and microphone and, and hook it all up. Uh, with like steering wheel controls and stuff. So now every time I get in my car, I'm really excited because I've got, you know, a competent device there where I can, you know, like 
run my podcast out of. And what I really like is like, you know, Siri and the microphone quality is a lot better than my Bluetooth audio had been for calls while I'm on the road. And then most importantly, I'm not texting constantly and, and distracted by tooling around with my phone while I'm driving uh, because the device is actually competent enough to let me communicate with others just by voice. So those are my picks. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming and talking to us. It was really fun and an interesting conversation. Yeah, totally. I'm I just thrilled to you know have been invited by you guys, and I really look up to all of you and what this podcast has you know done for the community over time. Uh, and so, to everyone listening, just you know, thanks very much for for having me today. You are most welcome. We'll, we'll wrap up the show on that note, and we'll catch you all next week. This episode is sponsored by Watch Me Code. Ruby and JavaScript go together like peanut butter and jelly. Have you been looking for regular, high-quality video screencasts on building JavaScript done by someone who really understands JavaScript? Derek Bailey's videos cover many of the topics we talk about on JavaScript Jabber and Ruby Rogues and are up on the latest tools and tricks you'll need to write great JavaScript. He covers language fundamentals, so there's plenty for everyone. Looking over the catalog, I got really excited and can't wait to watch them all. Go check them out at rubyrogues.com slash watchmecode. This episode is sponsored by Mad Glory. You've been building software for a long time, and sometimes it gets a little overwhelming. Work piles up, hiring sucks, and it's hard to get projects out the door. Check out Mad Glory. They're a small shop with experience shipping big products. They're smart, dedicated, will augment your team, and work as hard as you do. Find them online at madglory.com or on Twitter at madglory. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a c h e f l y dot com to learn more. Would you like to join the conversation with the rogues and their guests? Want to support the show? We have a forum that allows you to join the conversation and support the show at the same time. You can sign up at rubyrogues.com slash partner.